you started? Uh, today we're going to be talking about chemical analysis. <clears throat> now, analysis can include both qualitative and quantitative analysis. So both those things based on quality, what can be seen, you know, with or, or observed with the senses, um, and also quantitative, uh, that which can be measured and, and numerically um, quantified. Now there's three predominant methods to uh, chemical analysis that we're going to be talking about here. Uh, one is calorimetry, or colorometry. And this is analysis based on color. Um, we'll also be looking at gravimetric analysis, which will use stoichiometry for measured masses, as well as titration analysis, which will use uh, stoichiometry calculations for measured solution volumes. <coughs> Now, with the colorometry here, you basically have uh, different types of solution colors for different types of ion groups. So, anything from group one, so you talked about your alkali metals, uh, the solution will be colorless. Or group two, your alkali earth metals will be colorless. Or 17 uh, is going to be colorless. Now, once you get to a lot of the other types of ions, um, in your transition metals, then you will have solutions that do have a color. And this is talking about an aqueous solution, so when this ion is dissolved in water. Okay, so it can be an ionic compound which is dissolved in water and producing these ions. Uh, so if you look, take a look at the list, you've got um, chromium plus 2 ion, Blue plus three is green, cobalt plus two is pink, um, copper plus one green plus two blue, iron plus two is pale green plus three yellow brown, uh, manganese plus two pale pink, um, nickel plus two is green, chromium or chromate yellow, dichromate orange. And uh, manganate, perp. So you're not going to have to memorize these, okay? So you, what you're going to do is take a look on your in your data booklet, and in your data booklet there should be uh, a table that's similar to this that you can access, okay? Now, also in the group of colorometry is your spectrophotometer, okay? So your spectrophotometer, which can be used to measure the concentration of any desired colored ion, uh, even a solution that has several mixed colors, okay? So it can tell you the concentration based on basically a color density. <clears throat> uh, flame tests can also be used. And again, the colors for different types of flames, that's within your uh, data booklets. So these can be used to detect the presence of several metal ions. Uh, one I know off the top of my head, sodium is a yellow flame. So you're going to take a platinum or nichrome wire and dip it in a test solution and then hold it in a colorless flame and then see what happens. Okay. And here's some of the colors, lithium, red, sodium, yellow, potassium, and rubidium, violet, as well as cesium. Calcium, a yellowish red. A scarlet red from strontium. Barium, a yellowish green. Copper, blue to green. Boron, yellowish green. And lead is a blue-white. Okay. Now, moving on to the gravimetric analysis, this is a method that relies on measuring the mass of solids in wastewater and other liquids by weighing precipitates or residues to complete the analysis. So, for this, you have your preparation or precipitation completeness. 
it was one of the things. Uh, we're going to precisely measure a sample volume of the solution containing the limiting reagent and add approximately equal volume of excess reagent solution. Allow the precipitate to settle. Add a few more drops of excess reagent. Watch for the reaction and repeat this until no new precipitate forms. Okay, then you know that the reaction is complete. And one of the reagents will have been the reagent that is limiting, and one is going to be the excess reagent. Now, the one that you keep adding more and more of until the reaction stops, that's your excess reagent. And the limiting reagent is going to be <coughs> the sample you're testing, basically. Okay. Um, now, this uses stoichiometry in the solution, but there's a a twist um, because two not one reactant amounts will be specified. Now recognizing that one of the reagents will run out and the other uh, does not or before the other one does and then the reaction stops um, means that you have to know which one is the limiting reagent and that's the one that's going to be running out first. Reagent, okay so, how do I figure out which one's limiting if it's not specifically, you know, stated? Then you're usually going to convert the two substances into moles. Okay. So if I'm told I've got, you know, 20 grams of sodium hydroxide, I'll find out how many moles that would be. And if I've got, uh, you know, 30 grams of sodium chloride, I'll find out how many moles that would be. And then once I find out how many moles, then the smaller answer, the smaller amount of moles, that's the limiting reagent. So that's pretty easy. Um, now, oh, there's there's another thing we have to take into account there. If if there are coefficients, all right, then it's not just which one has the, the smaller number of moles because the coefficient will determine how much uh, I will need in comparison to other substances. So once I find the molar amount I would divide by the substance coefficient in the balanced equation and then the smaller answer would be the limiting reagent. Now you have to make sure that the molar amount is in the numerator and the coefficient is in the denominator. You're getting flipped around, and of course, you're going to have the wrong answer. <clears throat> so here's the limiting reagent type of question. I have 100 grams of uh, iron 3 chloride and 50 grams of hydrogen sulfide in a reaction. Uh, they're reacting, and they give us the balanced equation. Okay, so we're going to determine the limiting reagent. Well, first of all, we're going to divide the number of grams of iron 3 chloride, which is 100, by its molar mass, 162.208, and find out that that is 0.6165 moles. Divide that by the coefficient, end up with 0.30825. Hydrogen sulfide, same thing. Take the 50 grams divided by the 34.081, and I find out that it is 1.4 six, seven moles. So if I just did that step, I would be wrong. Okay, because I take a look at that and I say, okay, that is larger. Actually, turns out it's going to work out anyway. But um, if I divide by the three, I find that it, the comparison is a lot closer anyway. But the reagent that's present in the smaller amount is iron 3 chloride, which means that is the limiting reagent. Now, once I know that limiting reagent uh, amount um, is reacting, okay, then what? Let's just take a look. Well, then I can determine how much product's going to be formed. Okay. 
uh, it's going to, the amount of product forms is not going to be based on the excess reagent, but on the limiting reagent. All right, now, chloride. Oh, so this is part B of the same question. I get it. Okay, so we've determined that iron 3 chloride is the limiting reagent. So 0.6165 moles is how much was present in 100 grams. So we, we will take and use the ratios from our formula. And our original formula is here. So it's a 2 to 1 ratio, which means I end up with less iron 3 sulfide than uh, I have of iron 3 chloride as far as moles go. Okay, so I'll divide that by 2, basically. Okay, <clears throat> and I'll find out that that number is going to be 0 0.30825 moles will be produced. But, of course, it's asking us to determine the amount. Now, since the original amounts were given in grams, my answer is going to have to be in grams, too. So it's not enough just to find out how many moles of iron-3 sulfide are produced. I'm going to have to find out how many grams of iron-3 sulfide are produced which means I will multiply by 207.885 grams per mole. Okay, and I find out that th that is 64.08 grams. Now, determine the excess remaining. Okay, so um, if I determine how much hydrogen sulfide is used based on the ratio between hydrogen sulfide and iron 3 chloride, then I can say, okay, this is how much is used, how much did I have? So we calculated previously already and said that we had 1.467 moles. So if we subtract how much was used, then I end up with how much remains. So that's the excess remaining right there in moles. But <clears throat> in order to have that as an amount measured in grams, I'll have to multiply by the molar mass, and then I'll end up with the grams. Okay, another practice question. 15 grams of potassium racks with uh, 15 grams of iodine. Calculate which reactant is limiting and how much product is made. Okay. So, I'm going to write this down here and say, okay, the first thing we always want to start out with is the chemical reactions. We have potassium solid reacting with iodine. Now I have to remember here that iodine is I2. Okay, and it's usually uh, in its elemental form as a solid, so we can assume that. Now what's it going to produce? It's going to produce potassium iodide, but it's going to produce, we're going to balance this out here, yeah, two moles. This will be two moles. Here and this will balance All right, so this is our balance equation. That's what we got to start with. So now we're going to have to access our periodic table as well. Find out the molar mass of potassium. That's thirty-nine point one zero. So potassium. 31.90 grams per mole. And how about iodine? Iodine is 126.90 grams per mole. Okay, so. Um, 15 grams. 
quote second here, I'm going to tap, take the mass divided by molar mass, and that will give me the moles. So 15, 15 divided by 31.90 will give me, so let's see, divided by, I guess we have to do it this way. Let's try it first. N is going to equal mass divided by molar mass. <coughs> so 15 and 0 divided by 31.90. Give me a 0 0.4702. Right, now I'm going to have to divide by the coefficient, which is 2, divided by 2. So that will give me 0 0.235 moles. Now we're going to do the same thing here with iodine. Now Actually, I2 is going to have twice this molar mass, so I better do that. 126.90 equals, or times 2, 253.8 grams per mole for I2. <clears throat> Okay, so mass divided by molar mass, so 15 divided by 253.8.059, so I don't have, the coefficient is 1, equals 0 0.0591. So that's definitely lower. So my limiting reagent Limiting reagent is going to be iodine. Okay, so now that I found out the the amount of or which is the limiting reagent. Okay, and I know how many moles of the limiting reagent there are, I can find out how many moles of product. Well, it says how much product, so I'll find out the number of moles of product first and then I'll have to find out the actual amount in, in grams. So it's a one to two ratio. So basically I'm going to take this number, I'm going to multiply by two. So times two using the ratio between um, iodine and potassium iodide. I'll end up with 0 0.118 I2. Let's go back there. Moles. So that's how many moles of potassium iodide are produced. Now we need to find out the molar mass of potassium iodide. All right, so uh, 31.9 plus 126.9 gives me 158.8. So 158.8 um, grams per mole. So I'm going to multiply that by my number of moles times 0.1182 and I'll end up with, so times 0.1182 moles give me 18.8 grams. And that's how much uh, product will be made. <coughs> Now finding the amount of excess, once I find out, you know, what the limiting reagent is, so we figure out how to do that. Um, then you can calculate how much of the excess reactant is going to be reacting with the limiting reactant. And then, what's, which will be according to the, the stoichiometric ratios, that are present in the balanced equation. Well, once I've done that, 
And then I'll have to subtract the amount that was actually used from the amount present, okay, from the information. So can we find the amount of excess potassium in the previous problem? Okay. Well, we should be able to. We found that iodine is the limiting reactant, and 19.6 grams were produced. Is that what we found out? Hmm. Why is that 19.6? We have 18.8. I'm going to say they're wrong. Okay. But anyway, I'm not that far off. It all pin somewhere stay rounded, I guess. Anyway, um, if I can find out how much potassium, which I did calculate that out, how many moles of potassium was uh, point four seven four two. Now I do have to multiply that by two, because that's how much potassium is going to react with point. Uh, 0 0.0591 moles of iodine. <clears throat> now, but I found out how many did I have present there? Oh, hold on. Actually, what I should be doing here is once I found my, my total or my limiting reaction amount, okay, which is this right here. Then I'll apply that by two, 0 0.0591 times two, using my ratios. So that turns out to be 0.1194. So that I'm going to subtract from the number of moles I had. So 0 0.4702 minus 0.1194. Now I'll end up with 0.3508. Okay, so that'll be the amount of excess potassium. But then I'm going to have to multiply by um, the molar mass, which is times 81.9. Oh boy. Okay, uh, my calculator just got cleared here. That's hurting my feelings. 0 0.0591 times 2. Now I have to subtract 0 0.472 minus answer. So 0 0.352 moles. Okay, that's how far I go. Now I multiply by 30. 1.9 grams per mole, and I end up with 11.2 11.2 grams. <clears throat> All right. Um, now there's a second method we're going to take a look at just quickly. Uh, you can recognize the limiting reaction problem because there's more than one given amount. All right. Uh, now you can convert all of the reactants to the same product. It's another way to do it. Is say, okay, if I have this many moles of this reactant, how many moles of product will I produce? And then I say, okay, if I have this many moles of this other reactant, how many moles of product will I use? So whichever one gives me the lowest amount of product produced will be your limiting reagent. Okay, and the other one will be the excess. Now, to find the amount of excess, you're again going to subtract the amount used from the given amount. Okay, now, if you have to find more than one product, be sure to always start with the limiting reactant. Uh, that way, you don't have to determine which is the limiting reactant over and over again. And I don't have to. Okay. <clears throat> and then using the limiting reactant... <clears throat> amount present um, and the ratios from the balanced equation I can determine you know one product or the other product just using the different uh, coefficients 
Okay, so 45 grams of aluminum is added to 90 grams of HCl. What mass of hydrogen gas will be produced? Well, we can do it this way, where we find out how many moles of aluminum and HCl there are, and then we can divide by, well, then you can see how many moles you're going to produce according to the equation. And you find out that uh, you produce mm -hmm. more one way than the other. Okay. I need to put it in here. I don't really like it. Anyway, <clears throat> if you find how much of each, and here they go straight to the grams. So anyway, you'll find out that you'll produce more um, if you use the amount of aluminum than you would with the 90 grams of hydrochloric acid. Which means that uh, your hydrogen is going to be going to your agent. <laughs> the concept of yield this is a little different than the driving yield. Uh, what are we talking about? We talk about yield. Well, yield can be the actual yield, what you get in the lab, uh, as products when the chemicals are mixed. You should get a theoretical yield. This is what the balance equation tells us it should be, and the percent yield will be the actual over the theoretical divide, or times 100. Now here's an example, uh, 6.78 grams of copper is produced when 3.92 grams of aluminum are reacted with excess copper to sulfate. So you already know that aluminum is going to be the limiting reagent, so that's what you can go up there. Okay, now it tells us that 6.8 or 70 grams of copper is produced. So I already know what my actual yield is. Actual yield, there. A theoretical yield, I'm going to have to use the amounts given. So 3.92 grams of aluminum. I'd have to convert that into moles. Then use the coefficients of 2. And uh, da -da 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 -da. three. Is this how many how much copper is produced? So it's two to three ratio. Now using the molar amount for copper, I'm going to multiply by three, divide by two, and I'll end up with my molar theoretical yield. <clears throat> now I can convert that into mass by multiplying by the molar mass. Okay, then I will divide, well, the um, actual by theoretical and mul multiply by 100, that will give me the percent yield. The percent yield really tells us how efficient a reaction is. It can't be bigger than 100%. And theoretical yield will always be larger than the actual yield. You never get 100%. And this is due to impure reactants. Uh, there can be competing side reactions, a loss of product in a filtering process, or transferring between containers. And also it could be measurement errors. Okay, so that basically covers what we want to talk about today, uh, different types of chemical analysis the colorometry and the stoichiometric analysis involving solutions and we also talked a bit about theoretical yield. Okay, so once you listen to this tutorial make sure you um, create and submit a tutorial summary. Have a good day.